but then you drove the Rover BRM, which was a very special experience, I think. Yes, I went as a reserve driver for uh, Maranello Concessionaires, which were the biggest uh, private entry team um, known works Ferrari team. And I was reserve driver for Joe Bonnie, Graham Hill, Innes Island, and uh, another driver. Uh, so I qualified the car, ran the car, but they all they all stayed fit for the rest of the race, so I didn't get to drive, which is rather nice because I had a good night's sleep every night. I didn't have to get up at some silly hour in the morning to drive a racing car. And we were staying in a three-star Michelin Guide hotel, which is very important for a racing driver. You still have to learn about that. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so I went back the following year to drive, of all things, a gas turbine car, helicopter engine in a Rover BRM. The car looked great, but I mean, it was unbelievably slow. And uh, anyway, there was no braking, no engine braking at all. You know, you took your foot off the gas and the turbine kept running. And it, you know, it was only the brakes. So, you know, in any kind of car, we all drive, you shift down, you get engine brake. And this thing, you had nothing at all. And the brakes weren't all that good in those days. And I said, what do I do if we have a brake problem? Because occasionally we'll have, you know, a brake balance bar, brake, maybe have only front wheel brakes or rear wheel brakes. What do you do in this case? Well, I don't know. I said, well, Jesus, I'm going to drive Le Mans 24 hours and you don't know what I can do if there's a failure. He said, well, you just get it down as slow as it'll go and then you put your foot out the door. <laughs> you know, the, the guy, the designer actually said that. God be my witness. And it was at that time I sort of lost confidence in the team. Uh, but Graham Hill was the number one driver for BRM. I was the number two driver. And we tossed up. And the fun thing was we tossed up whoever won the toss had to drive the first stint because we really didn't want to drive it. And, but the deal was that if that happened you were driving into the sandbank at the end of <laughs> Mulsanne Street because we couldn't bear going round for 24 hours in this device and you know Graham of course he didn't mean to do it but sure as hell he went into the first lap right into the sandbank at the end of Mosan, and it swallowed a whole bundle of sand, and it took the edge off of all the the turbine blades. So it meant that instead of revving at 82,000 revs, that's what the turbine was revving at, we had to do 50,000, which meant that I got passed on the Mulsanne Street by a Triumph Herald. <laughs> And Jochen Ritt, who was one of my best friends with Mason Gregory, an American driver, was driving the winning 250 LM Ferrari, lapped me every three laps, can you imagine? And the bloody thing lasted until the end of the race. So we finished 11th, can you imagine? But we were the first British car home, which doesn't say a lot for Britain's sporting career at that time. They had zips on the, or but they had buttons on their overalls, and a button fell into the turbine. And after that, they insisted that they have zips on the turb on their overalls for then on in. But of course, you never drove it again, though. Well, I always had buttons on my fly, actually. In, in, that, in that race, I put seven buttons into the turbine. <laughs> nothing <laughs> no, nothing negative work. seemed to happen. <laughs> Just bad luck, really. Yeah, today, today it is, the cars are so refined now and, and so bulletproof with their reliability that we li literally drive every lap as hard as we possibly can go. Um, because if you don't, somebody else will, and that car will last and, 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 they'll, and they'll win the race. So there's definitely times, obviously, when strategy comes, in, comes into play and, and, you know, maybe you aren't driving at 100% for maybe an hour of the race or two hours of the race, but we are literally driving as hard as we possibly can. Um, to, to Jackie's point there, you know, nowadays we have paddle shift in the car and things like that. And when we had an H pattern or sequential, if we were way behind, and as you kind of said, you know, if you were 10 laps down and you had no, or, well, Le Mans, 10 laps is nothing, but if you were 50 laps down and you had no chance to do well, the drivers always got together and kind of said, okay, well, 
So if it's if it's that bad, if we're that far behind, one of us has to blow the motor up or do something to the car so we can just end this now. Because if you're, there's nothing worse than being, you know, behind, you know, let's say two hours in the race and you you literally have no chance and you just drive around for 22 hours, you know, just just because you have to. So the drivers always, you know, try to just figure out and say, okay, it's your turn now to, to, to blow this thing up. And we can't do it anymore. We can't, there's nothing, all the controls and the computers and stuff like that, now we can't do that. So. Okay, Tommy, let's have a little news here. Did you ever do that? I've, I've never been tasked with that. <laughs> but we, we do have one thing that, that usually happens. If, if a driver gets in the car and drives around, something sometimes, you know, goes wrong with the car on the racetrack and it might be minor enough where you don't want to talk about it so much. And you get out of the car and then the next driver cops in the car your teammate and then he goes out and then that becomes a bigger problem the car blows up and we call that pulling the pin on the grenade so you literally you just drop the grenade in, the, in your seat and you say yep there you go have fun with that one and then 20 minutes later the motor or something goes wrong and you know then he gets all the blame to start with and then you slowly kind of creep and you tell him hey actually I, I think i think i caused that one sorry